Welcome to Crimson Guitars, welcome to my home studio. I'm Ben Crow, guitar builder and uh, all round insane dude. I forgot something. Do you know what I forgot? I forgot the damn veneers. Uh, I'm gonna have to take this apart, clean the joint and reclamp up, but with some nice black veneer because every other joint has black veneer in it. Poop. <laughs> um, what an intro. I am finally, for the first time since January, building a scratch built guitar. Uh, through COVID, I've had to build a new workshop uh, at home rather than at the factory, and I am totally loving it. Uh, in this video, I am going to sort out uh, sort out wings for the headstock. I am going to figure out some custom burl maple binding from uh, multiple pieces of offcuts from the top and the back. I'm going to joint the top and the back. I'm probably, come to think of it, going to have to make a shooting board. Which one of you stole my shooting board? Burn it. Ah, <laughs> yay! Offcut. This came out of the back of the neck and uh, it is going to be perfect for expanding the width of the headstock. I need to cut it down the center. Now, when you are gluing things up uh, at an angle, like these headstock wings, they slip and they slide, especially once you have put your glue in place. Now, there has been, for decades and more, a trick, apparently, whereby you sprinkle table salt onto the joint. This creates enough friction so that the joint doesn't slip and slide and move about and misalign itself. But the salt also dissolves into the glue and doesn't actually affect the joint nor the integrity of the glue, etc, etc, etc. Does that make you happy? That makes me very happy. I probably put a little bit too much salt in my, uh, in my excitement. Um, I don't think it needed anywhere near that much. We're good? Bloody hell. <sighs> All right, so the question is, I forgot something. Do you know what I forgot? Um, I forgot the damn veneers. Uh, I'm gonna have to take this apart, clean the joint and reclamp up, but with some nice black veneer because every other joint has black veneer in it. Poop. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I turned it over and I said, Yes, that's right, and I was checking to make sure that the outer white strips were, were uh, angled in the correct way, all pointing towards the, uh, the end. Um, yes, I'm gonna stop waffling, I'm gonna take the clamps off. The, it proved the point though, the salt works, done. There was absolutely zero slippage. Fool. And again. Mm. Okay, you go down there. Fantastic. Little bit of salt, little bit of salt. You're on. Little bit of salt. Fantastic. Oh no, far too much. Prue. Who is this Prue you? to use these, they're a bit stronger. No slipping. Okay, yes. I had far too much fun and I made a mistake as a result of it. That was 
awesome, zero slippage whatsoever. Um, these, these clamps, I don't think were quite man enough uh, for the amount of salt that I put on, put on in the first place anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, I suppose the good thing with me taking that joint apart was that I saw that immediately the salt did disintegrate. I'm not sure if I prefer it over using locating pins. I'm sure I don't prefer it over using locating pins, but um, yeah, that is, it works. It's cool. Uh, I need to get some tissue and clean this up and, and move on. Who left the salt on my bench? Uh, okay, so tidied up, good to go. I, I honestly have lost my shooting board. I have no idea where the, that has gone. I'm assuming it's at the other workshop, but I was sure I brought it here. So let's make a new shooting board because it's pretty much essential for the next task. Uh, I have got a chunk of, I think it's probably chipboard covered in uh, Sapili veneer, but it will do, it will do the job uh, at least in the short term. You want something prefabricated. You want MDF or good quality plywood or something like that. Uh, it has to be, it wants to be flat. I suppose it doesn't have to be absolutely perfectly flat, but something that's warp resistant is better. Can you imagine anything easier? And damn useful too. So what we have here is a stop, something nice and flat and square and your plane. Ooh, not quite flat, there was a... <laughs> Let's get rid of that. When faced with a choice of which chisel to use, often, the bigger the better. And then just plane down. Now I'm getting some squeaking, which means I need wax. Just general beeswax. I'm not sure where we're squeaking. Now, one thing about uh, planes and how you set up your planes, is when you're sharpening the blade, you can either sharpen the blade so the front edge is perfectly flat or with a slight camber. And uh, there are different reasons for doing this. Uh, with a jointing plane like this, the blade is flat from side to side, from edge to edge. That doesn't make sense, but hey. Uh, with a plane that I'm using to hog out a lot of material, like my number three, etc., I've got a slight curve to the edge of the plane, and it acts a little bit like a gouge, and it takes bigger shavings, but less precisely. So, that being said, I've got a lot of jointing to do here. And we're gonna clamp it together with masking tape. Done. Under tension and good to go. The nice thing about doing it that way is that there are no massive clamps holding everything down and a, a well-planed joint means that you don't need huge amounts of pressure. Yeah, basically, this is better. If you can't hold a joint together just with the, just the tension of a couple of fingers like that, then it's not, not good enough. Next job for the shooting board is to take some of these pieces and create binding for the, for the neck. And uh, I need to join the one edge while it's still relatively big uh, before I glue it all together and, and well, play silly buggers, really. So the plan is I'm going to very carefully match a grain line so that instead of a horrible square or 45 degree joint or something that is blatantly obvious, it'll be hidden in 
some of this glorious, beauteous um, burl and figuring that we have on these, and nobody will ever know except us. Uh, but before I do that, I need to choose a piece of grain to cut so that I've, I do that before uh, before I glue it in. Yes, I just dropped a piece. I'm going to ignore it and pretend it didn't happen. So this is the other half, and it's going to join up there-ish. Okay, at this stage, there's a sneezing boy in the background. <laughs> at this stage, I've got my two pieces of, uh, of wood. I need to join to them. Uh, I also want to have a, an accent piece of the thin black veneer uh, underneath it and I've been toying with different ways of doing this but essentially I'm going to glue these two together um, and then glue it down onto a piece of veneer then tidy it up as required and it will require a little bit of tidying up and then glue it on to the neck. Um, it's a little bit fiddly but you know it's my fault really isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. Done, you better. Forgive the noise. My son is in the background currently wire wrapping a sword handle uh, that he's just made out of out of the offcut from his neck. No, that's pulling too far. That was pulling that out, pulling the uh, rear end out a little bit too far. Basically, this is a bit too high in reality. I need a little bit of sideways pressure, but a lot of down. And just to make sure. Awesome, you remember that piece of ebony that uh, stabbed you earlier? Can I have it? It's just poking out there. And if you've got another one, if you can see another one. Fantastic, thank you very much. Do you want to be my apprentice? Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. Yes! The pay is terrible. Sure, sure. <laughs> it's got to be better than the uh, non-existent uh, non-existent pocket money, isn't it? Oh no, wait, the non-existent pocket money is because I bought you a gigantic halo nerve gun. Okay, we have reached the end of the day. I'll be back tomorrow for more. Uh, I have jointed up the back and the front. They're sitting there. Uh, for the guy who wished me happy birthday the other day, I've only just twigged as to why. No, that was uh, something that I was filling for somebody else. Don't know how it ended up back here. This is done. We've glued that up. That'll, that's almost ready. I <laughs> played with salt. That was fine. Um, and worked and it's fun. And here is uh, a sword that my son has just made out of the central section. Look at that. Well, I mean, the dude's 10. If I could make something like that when I was 10, I'm pretty sure my guitars would be a bit better now. Anyway, well, that's fun. And uh, yeah, some sort of a tooth. We think lion, potentially. Uh, replica? Not sure. What else? I think that's more than enough to be getting on with. Uh, frets tomorrow. Becoming a guitar. <laughs> on with the job. I'm looking forward to this. When frets go on a guitar, that is when it starts to properly become a guitar. What's up?
that was a little dodgy. Uh, I was holding it at a slight angle because I didn't want to run the risk of touching the fretboard because of the camber. Maybe a flush trim Japanese saw or something like that. But, uh, <laughs> or maybe I could have just uh, uh, cut them to the right height pre-gluing them down. I think that would have been better. Ready for planing now then. Okay, I need to cut a couple of mitres and fit the end of the binding here. Now, you do this right at the end because if you stick it on first and then bring everything down to the same level of the fretboard, you're gonna knock it off or chip it in some way. And that would be sad. Good sharp chisel. Okay, so I need to bring the sides down to the same size as the neck blank. Now, I've already done the bevels to the neck blank rather than the existing material here. I probably should have swapped the order of those jobs around, to be honest. Hashtag, always be learning. That was fun. I, I love using good sharp tools. Here we have it. There is a very subtle thing going on here that uh, I was hoping would be a little bit more apparent, but the binding is also going from slightly thin at this end to slightly wider at this, which is following the, the overall pattern of everything that we've got going on. Anyway, I'm going to check, I'm going to check and see where we're at. Make sure with this little tool, you can't see what's happening, can you? Uh, yep, so 12 inch radius, but also it is the right depth. And uh, I'm going to do that. And then it is on to fretting. Well, preparing for fretting. Everything is preparing for fretting. Don't fret. Oh, I'm sorry. And here we are about to fret this guitar. It is a, it's a fantastic process and uh, relatively straightforward once you have done it uh, uh, quite a bit. But uh, anyway, here we go. First of all, you need to prepare your fretboard. I sand to at least 320 grit, probably 400 grit uh, paper. Make sure I am keeping it flat and level. I use uh, crimson leveling beams almost exclusively. Once you're absolutely certain that the fretboard is sanded down and that the fret slots are deep enough, using the tool to check that, we move on to bending the fret wire to the correct radius. Now the correct radius is very precisely 
a little bit tighter than the radius that you have on the fretboard. You want the fret ends to go in first as you're hammering or pressing them in, and then the tang pushes out sideways to lock themselves in place inside of the wood. Uh, we are bending the fret wire using a crimson fret bender. Next up, you've got a roll of fret wire, and we want to cut that to size. Again, very precisely, a little bit wider than the fretboard. Uh, you do not want to install a fret and then have to remove it immediately. Once you've cut them to size, detang the ends of the wire using a fret tang cutter, and this is to uh, allow for the fact that this particular guitar has binding, of course. Uh, you don't want to remove more than you have to, but again, something to worry about is as you hammer the fret in, or press it in, however you're going to install it, you do not want to pop the binding off the edge because you haven't removed quite enough tang. This is something that not very many people do, and it is, in my mind, very, very important, especially if you are new to this. Um, but either way, it just makes life much easier. With a good, small, triangular file, being very careful not to mar the fretboard, you will bevel both edges of the fret slots. This helps locate the fret in the slot and somehow keeps the fret from tipping over. If you hit it with the hammer at a slightly wrong angle, I often used to, when I first started, end up with the, tang go with the fret going in sideways to a certain extent, and just, it doesn't work very well. In fact, that is an absolute nightmare and something to be avoided. So bevel the slots as much as possible uh, beforehand. We are now finally getting to the point of actually installing the frets. I am very, very adamant that you want to fill the fret slot uh, that isn't going to be filled with the fret with glue. This isn't to hold the fret in place, it is to solidify the, the neck itself. You don't want 22 or 24 um, quarter slots worth of space in something that you want to be solid and stable and resonant. So I flood fret slots three or four at a time with standard wood glue and then install the frets. Uh, this is also much better than using epoxy or super glue because wood glue you wipe away uh, with a, a damp rag and it does not affect the fretboard in any way. If you use super glue, for example, uh, while the argument is that the super glue dries harder and doesn't shrink very much, uh, it is an absolute nightmare to clean off and you can spend an hour or more uh, getting your fretboard back to something that is worth looking at. I personally prefer installing the frets using a hammer. Uh, it is how I learned and I get them in nice and even. I have used presses before. I have used uh, clamping calls and the like, and it really depends on who you are and what you prefer. Bang them in. Uh, as I said earlier, especially with the hammer, you want to hit the frets in from the outside edges and then peen it in from the center out. So the, the outside edges are compressing out and the tang itself is biting underneath uh, pristine wood, which helps keep it in place for longer. Immediately clean off the excess glue on the batch of three or four frets that you're doing with a damp rag and uh, move on. I mightily endorse isotunes or hearing protection of any sort when hammering in your frets. This is essential equipment. Crimson 10, get a tenor off, but so much better. <sighs> Time for the fret heads. <laughs> Once you have finished all of the frets, we file them flush with the edge of the fretboard and then file the correct angle in. Uh, be very careful not to go too steep. We use a crimson fret end beveling file for this. And eventually, it's a fret level crown and polish, but that, that is gonna be another video. This is the first bit of the entire instrument that's actually finished. The fretboard is sanded, 
It's nice and flat, it's pretty, the inlay is done, the frets are in. Yes, they need to be polished, but it's, it's one of those little mini milestones that uh, just makes me happy. I mean, the rest of it looks like poop, still. But, you know, we'll get there. I completely forgot these here. Um, done and dusted. Masking tape joint. Uh, it absolutely, totally works. And, uh, well, we really do have a guitar coming. I do love those holes. Maybe I can figure out a way to have them as sound holes. Oh, come on, up you come. How's that? What do you think? Well, I think I love it. Anyway, at this point, I need to say thank you very much for subscribing, uh, for watching. If you haven't subscribed, just, I've already thanked you. You kind of have to now. Uh, hit that bell button and all that jazz. Uh, we're in the Christmas period. There is something happening on Christmas Day on this channel, and you really, really want to watch it. 100%. Um, and other than, other than that, just, yeah, keep safe. Keep happy and uh, have a good one. See you soon. Goodbye.